Hello again, I'm Joel Barthelemy. Over the past year, I've spent a lot of time in this weekly video blog explaining why Connected Health in the form of telehealth or telemedicine is vitally important to the U.S. healthcare system as well as to other countries around the world. Sometimes statistics can drive the point home. In a recent appearance before a congressional subcommittee, Dr. Karen Ruban, a former president of the American Telemedicine Association, provided lawmakers with some numbers about the University of Virginia's high-risk obstetrics telemedicine program and others. We've reduced preterm delivery and reduced days in our NICU by 39 percent. That's a huge cost saver for our state Medicaid program and for the payer community. In stroke, if you can provide timely access to a stroke neurologist and clot, appropriate use of clot busting medication, that saves huge disability, saves lives, and saves nursing home care. Nursing homes are a wonderful place because of the challenge of transporting patients, the cost of the Medicare program. Remote patient monitoring in the home, we've done about 650 patients we've supported after discharge from the hospital, and we have reduced readmission by 50% in those patients who would have bounced back. So those, again, cost savings. Statistics are useful, but impersonal. They turn people into numbers. Dr. Brenda Didiman, a Virginia dermatologist, knows from her own practice that patients would benefit from telemedicine if it were available. I really think that if we look at our rehab centers and nursing homes, how we could bring the care to the patient instead of bringing the patient to a office or an emergency room without knowing where they need to be. For example, if we bring the care to the patient, we can evaluate a leg ulcer or an early infection more quickly and get the care implemented so they do not end up a patient that's hospitalized. Secondly, I think one of our biggest patient populations is our obese and diabetic population that can be monitored through teleophthalmology. They can be monitored through teledermatology. They have leg ulcers are, again, a big uh, cost to the healthcare system as well as the other complications of diabetes. So I feel that we can see this in many specialties, that we bring the care to the patient and the system will save money. Despite the benefits and successes shared by Dr. Rubin and Dr. Didiman, there are a number of things holding back the widespread use of telemedicine. One large roadblock is Medicare. It continues to apply vague requirements and place artificial restrictions on the reimbursement paid to doctors who treat seniors. Maybe that made sense 15 years ago when telemedicine was nothing more than an antiquated video conferencing system. Maybe then, but certainly not now. Why should the access, convenience, and cost savings that the technology affords be limited to people who live in rural and medically underserved areas? The short answer is that it shouldn't. But if Medicare won't reimburse for telemedicine across the board, there is little incentive for physicians to see patients remotely. It won't happen tomorrow, and it may not happen even next year. But changes must be made in Medicare to make health care equitable and accessible to all Americans. What do you think? Send me an email. I'd like to hear from you. My email address, as before, is Joel's blog, that's J-O-E-L-S-B-L-O-G, at globalmed.com. I'm Joel Bartholomew.